Points, and this is the uh, core voice planning and deployment. Um, I work in the Link server team, and I actually work on voice features. I've uh, worked on a variety of features, uh, Exchange UM integration, E911, Call Park. Um, I go back a while. I actually worked on some of the initial uh, you know, prototypes we did for VoIP and even the prototypes for RCC, which was a, a long time ago. So. Um, anyway, what we're going to talk about today is um, a, a variety of topics. Uh, it was a bit of a hard uh, session for me to put these slides together because I know there's a lot of people that, that have some link experience that are probably in the audience, um, but I, and, and there's some people that are just kind of trying to understand what link is from a voice perspective. So the way we've laid this out is, is the, we're going to kind of walk through what the architecture of a topology, a link voice topology is, the basic architecture and then actually walk through kind of the feature overviews of the new features that uh, weren't in um, OCS R2, for instance. And then I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about uh, voice routing, give an overview on that and, and some of the um, kind of planning considerations around it, particularly because that's a fairly complex uh, topic and there's always a lot of questions around that. So um, <clears throat> it's a fair, I uh, got a, quite a bit of slides. I may have a hard time getting through all of it in an hour, but I'm gonna try. Um, if we don't, so I would say it's hold the questions to the end if at all possible, and uh, if need be, I'll, I'll, I'll stay outside for a while, and I'll immediately go down to our booth afterwards, so I'm happy to answer as many questions as I can. So, <clears throat> oh, actually, some of the stuff I won't be talking about. Um, there has been sessions already on resiliency, uh, there's a session this afternoon, I think at 4.30, uh, on, on interop with voice. I would highly recommend people to go to that. And there's also been some other discussion around um, call admission control, and I think some of that is actually part of this afternoon's discussion as well. So here's a PowerPoint slide of a basic link topology when it comes to the voice component. So it's kind of, I emphasize this with voice. You see on the top, there's the UC endpoints there. We do have a variety of handsets that are both USB handsets and IP phones. Um, they're all made by various partners that we have. Um, I don't have a listing of every one of them, but we have a partner website that you can actually get a whole list of that stuff. Um, our UC pool here, again, we're actually showing a pool. You can, you can do all this in a single edition server if you want for a pilot, but our, our recommended pool topology is, is that you actually deploy front-end servers. Um, that actually includes the mediation server. So one of the things we did in this release was it allowed the collapsing of the mediation server into the front-end component. Um, there's a back-end component, which, which uh, is basically a store, database store, which stores um, user contact information and presence. Um, I'm also calling out here that there's a audio-video vi audio conferencing server, which is rec recommended to be separated for scaling purposes. Um, and then I actually show down below is basically the, the sort of SIP connectivity into the PSTN world, whether it's a PBX or actually the PSTN itself. We actually still do support standalone mediation servers. Um, in this case, we recommend that for SIP trunking because some of the SBCs that they're communicating with may not be able to actually receive calls from a variety of, of, of FQDNs. Um, and we also do direct SIP support to various IP PBXs. Um, I think there's a list of those on our partner website as well, the ones we've certified. And we also have these uh, survival branch office appliances, or SBAs, which is on the bottom of the screen here. Um, and those are made, and again, I think this was part of the resiliency talk, but it's basically meant to be deployed at a branch office. They're a partner solution that combines a gateway with some of our core link software. Um, we also, the analog devices on the bottom of the screen, we actually support those through our partner integration. I have a little bit more information on how that works later in the presentation. Off to the right, there's a monitoring server on top. The reason it's called out is that is where all the CDR and quality of experience information is, is, is logged. And uh, Exchange UM on the bottom, we actually support the continue, it's the only voicemail support for Link. Um, in this version of Link, we also not only support uh, Exchange UM online, but we support Exchange UM that's part of Office 365. So we do, um, off to the left, we do support uh, interop with you know, Federation um, to the various you know, public IM clouds like MSN, AOL, Yahoo, 
uh, remote users. Uh, we access remote users for a voice, you know, IAM and presence through the Edge server as well. And you can federate directly with businesses. So now I want to uh, walk through a variety of new features that we introduced in, in Link. Um, Call Park was one of those that uh, we had a lot of feedback on that said, you know, we got these pockets of users. We can't move over to Link. We actually need this feature. Um, so this was a, one of the bigger work streams around the voice activity, you know, in the Link release. What this is, uh, the feature essentially allows for those, you know, most people probably know this in the audience, those that don't, it, it, it basically allows a call, to, an incoming call to be parked into a queue so that, or, you know, essentially placed on hold by one endpoint and, be, and retrieved by another endpoint by dialing a number. Um, this is actually supported by all of the Link 2010 clients that are listed here, the uh, Link soft uh, client uh, attendant and the phone edition. It's important that, you know, pretty much any, any phone device, whether it's a Link client from 2007 or a PBX phone, any phone device that's able to dial that number that, you, that um, the call got parked onto can actually retrieve the call. So there's a slight distinction there. Um, calls parked, we, we term the range of numbers that are, uh, calls are parked at as orbits. Um, those are generally internal numbers that aren't assigned to users. So you have to be careful about that, but we do, our, our logic, you know, is such that we actually, you know, <coughs> excuse me, if a call came into an extension that was defined as an orbit and it was also assigned to a user, the user would win out. Um, orbits are also supported at the pool level. So, Basically, for every pool, you either need to define orbits, or if you don't want call park, you should turn those off. Um, anything else? Uh, oh, DIDs are not assigned as well, so you actually cannot assign a number and reach an orbit from external to the network. Um, there's a couple of caveats. Um, uh, you've got some feedback early on in the release that um, a couple of companies have asked about. Uh, one of those is you actually can't just park a call at a known destination. When you park a call, you receive the orbit back automatically. So the system tells you which orbit number you're going to get. The other thing is you actually can't um, pick up a call from any ringing extension. So that's one of the things that um, it's not capable of doing right now. Unassigned numbers. So another feature that we added was this unassigned number um, area. And basically, it was a way to provide call treatment for calls that are, that are in a number block for a given customer, but yet are not assigned to a user. So you got this DID range. They're all coming in from the, uh, you know, from the PSTN or the PBX. And sometimes numbers get called, and, and uh, some, you, know, you, you want a better experience, basically. And what we, we, we do is we, we have this table where we can actually define unassigned numbers. So, so as part of that table, essentially what we do is define the whole, whole range. That's one option. You can define the whole range of company numbers. And again, if an incoming call comes in, we will try to match that to a user. But if for some use and a user is not you know, assigned this number, we will reference this table. So their options are then what you can actually do with this call. You can actually play an announcement to it. You can actually transfer it to the Exchange IVR or some other phone number as well. So we give a variety of different treatment options for that. Interesting, you can also actually use this for um, blocking calls if you want. You know, instead of actually explicitly um, having to go to each, um, <coughs> pardon, um, in, in your routing and define um, all of the numbers that you would actually like blocked, you could actually list them here. Like within the US, you could list 900 numbers. And if, and if actually somebody tried to dial one of those, you could actually route it to an announcement that said this number is, is, is not allowed to be dialed. You can also um, pick an individual number for some reason. Maybe there was a, a help desk number within a company that uh, got changed for some reason. And you want to provide a special announcement to that. You can define a specific number if you would as well. Location and E911. Um, this, again, was a very big work item. Um, I could probably give a talk about this for an hour just on itself, but I'm going to try to cover the basics here, and if people have questions, you can, we can chat about it later. We actually um, um, lit up location and E911, um, and by location, I mean the ability to actually 
for a link client to actually retrieve a location automatically. So we actually built this role into our front end servers. It's called the location information service. And what this does is it, it's essentially a, a mapping of network elements. By network elements, it's like a subnet or a BSS ID of a wireless access point, um, a port you know, from a switch, that sort of thing. And you actually associate a civic address or a civic ad, you know, which is a street address with maybe an in-building number, like a room number to those. So link clients can, they, when they act, they automatically request a location. So you have the ability to now deploy location as part of a link deployment um, and actually has nothing to do with E911. So people actually, uh, the clients will actually publish this in their presence document. So what happens is that people that are actually your buddies have the ability to actually see where you're actually at if you want that sort of capability. You can also turn it off as, as an admin or an end user. The, the, the relation here to E911 is, is that that same list is actually also used for locations. So the core requirement for E911 is, is that when somebody dials an emergency dial string, which in the United States is 911, um, the call, the, the emergency, what they call the PSAP, the first responders, um, when they answer the call, they need to be able to correlate the location with the phone number. So the solution we actually use, um, we, our clients acquire this location, and they actually convey that with an emergency call. So um, we require a partner um, that is able to actually route these, or receive these calls. They actually include the location in the SIP invite. The partner parses this location and then, and then figures based upon where the location is which PSAP you actually connect to. So this is a very important feature from a soft phone requirement because with IP phones, you know, you can actually, they, while users can move them around, you know, generally when they get plugged in, they will, they, they will stay that way for a while. I'd prefer to pick this up after the, show, after the session if you would. So, um, so there's um, an interesting way that we actually allow to configure this or enable this feature. It's not on by default, obviously. The, the requirement there is, is generally, it seems, talking to customers. They, because of state regulations or building size and things like that, they don't necessarily turn on E911 all over the place. They might have a location, like in, uh, in Microsoft, the, the Redmond campus is E911 zone because of the size and the Washington state regulations. So we allow this to actually be turned on by subnets. So this is not really related to the subnets for the location themselves, but you can actually define all the subnets in a geographical area and assign a location policy to that that essentially lights up the E911 feature so that people roaming in and out of this area, they won't necessarily know that they're being enabled for E911. Their clients actually pick this up automatically and when they do, they're enabled for nine, E911, and at that point, if they do need to dial a 911 call, the location would be transmitted out. So, um, as I noted before, this does require some routing, a partner, so you actually have to obtain E911 routing service from one of our partners. There's a couple of other features that we've added. Um, we have the ability to um, IM a security desk for these calls. So if there is a security desk that wants to be aware of it, pending emergencies within a company, we can actually essentially broadcast an IM to a group of security desk people that includes the location. It essentially starts an IM session. Um, and we also have the ability that the security desk can get conferenced into that if they want to. One other interesting feature about this is while it was designed around E911 requirements in the US, you can actually use this for location-based routing for other dial strings, or emergency dial strings, I should add. So in Europe, I believe it's 112, although I think UK it's 999, I've read recently. Um, you can actually ensure that you could set up different, what are called different zones or network sites, and actually assign a policy to each of those network sites that actually directs traffic out to a specific gateway. So as people roamed all around Europe, for instance, they would actually pick up this 111 dial string, but based upon where they're at, it would actually direct that call to the appropriate you know, gateway in the network. So for instance, if I'm a user, I'm in Munich, and I happen to travel to London or Paris um, and dial 112, and I'm in one of the Paris location, for instance, it would actually could go out of Paris gateway. Now, the, there, there's no, 
emergency service providers, as we call those in Europe, the way there are in North America that can parse this location, but nonetheless, you can actually at least assure that the, it's getting out a, a, a relevant gateway. So. Additional feature was private line. A lot of people are in the audience are probably aware of what this feature is, but basically from, from the link perspective, it's, it's very similar to what, the way it works in a PBX. Um, we actually allow the publishing of a private line number to a user. Um, this private line number is not actually listed in the Active Directory, so people are not able to see this when they, when they you know, look at the gal from Outlook, for instance. Um, the um, features around this are, um, <coughs> excuse me again, um, they actually bypass most of the inbound routing rules. So rules like simul ring, actually simul ring is the exception. Call forwarding, delegation, team call, do not disturb, all of those actually don't apply. So if a user gets assigned a, a private line number, um, they can pass this out to you know, their you know, select group of people that want to reach them and bypass their normal sort of phone configuration if they would. Um, the way it uh, works, the exception of simul ring is, is that the intention is, is that that person actually has simul ring set up on their main number. They probably also want to receive any sort of you know, private line calls should they be away from their desk. There's a couple of caveats. Well, one caveat around this is it, it, it calls can be you know, essentially private lined um, enabled from link. Somebody calling that private line number from a OCS 2007 R2 you know, deployment, they won't actually be able to, to reach that private line because it's a new attribute that's part of the link you know, you know, uh, attributes that were introduced. So it's a bit of a caveat there. Uh, another one is, is that private line only works on inbound calls. You can't basically say, I want to make a private line outbound call. But uh, voicemail is integrated across both. So when you actually receive any call on a private line, it does go into the same exchange inbox. We also added some caller ID presentation control. So again, um, a lot of customers that ask us, hey, there's a group of people or within my company, I want to mask you know, caller ID that actually goes out to the PSTN. We didn't have this capability. It, by default, we actually sent all of the uh, the calling line IDs out. So we now have the ability to essentially apply um, calling ID masks on specific trunk routes. So basically you can actually say on this trunk route, this is the caller ID that I actually want to get sent out. So it can be the company's main number or something like that. You can actually use this to um, assign this to different groups of people by essentially the group of people that want to do this, you can actually create a separate usage and a route for them so that you can actually ensure that their calls go out even though they might be in the same location as other people that actually you know, don't want this feature. So it's not really a user table, meaning that, that it's assigned on a trunk, so you can't go up and say that's not some policy that's set on Roy's user object or something like that. It's more of a trunk policy. Um, there is a, uh, the interaction with simul ring is, for instance, if, if Alice had simul ring set up, in my example here, where she actually has caller ID masked and simul ring set up, if Bob called her and she picked up the call on her simul ring, that is the one instance where we actually do pass her primary caller calling line ID. Here's just an example of how you configure this where you basically say, I want to suppress the caller ID and then here's the alternate caller ID that you want to send out. Again, it's typically a, uh, like a main company number. This here happens to be the uh, Redmond uh, Microsoft uh, number from what I can tell. Monitoring, I don't want to get into this too much, but I just want to emphasize, you know, I did talk about having a monitoring server before. The important thing from a voice perspective is, is that this is where the CDR and Q, you know, quality of experience data are logged. There's a lot of reports you know, that can be run about this, about voice usage. I think there was a session yesterday about this, so I, I don't want to get into this. You do have to kind of keep an eye about how this scales. If you have an extremely large organization, that sort of thing, uh, make sure your database is, you know, is accurately sized. Common area phone support. We did not have this capability either until Link. Uh, we now uh, have a, a class, or a <coughs> excuse me, low-cost uh, low IP phones plus the functionality to actually enable this uh, to be deployed in common areas or shared areas like a lobby, you know, kitchen area, things like that. The 
kind of the core functionality of what these actually allow is, is that a, a, a admin can define these common area phones and allow a tech to go out and just plug these in without having any sort of, you know, kind of back and forth, you know, intervention there. So the tech can go to plug them, or the admin can configure them, the, the tech can go plug them in, and there isn't this tight coupling. Um, you can control their calling behavior. So we have a voice policy concept that I'm going to talk about a little later in the, in the, uh, in the deck. But you can basically restrict their calls because of that, not only their, you know, what they can, uh, the numbers they can call, but also the functionality. You can restrict forwarding and transfer and that sort of thing. Um, you can also block these. Um, so, for instance, if somebody decides to pick one of these up and take it home with them and decide, oh, I want to have a, a work at home link device, you know, and, and you notice that this is missing, you can actually go in and actually block external access for any sort of calling or common area sort of phone. You can also change the pin. So that if somebody steals this and just takes this to their office and thinks they're going to start calling things, you can actually change the pin on that that would actually block it being authenticated. Um, these actually do also support hot desking, which is a, a, a kind of an interesting common area scenario. You can actually have a phone defined as a common area device, and yet a user can actually come in like myself and can actually um, you know, authenticate as you know, Roy Koontz at Microsoft.com, for instance, and it can be my phone for the next hour if I need, need it to be. I can then sign off, or if I'd, I haven't used the phone in a while, it would actually log off and kind of return to being a common area device, so it's kind of a neat feature. Um, so it actually allows this you know, temporary knowledge worker support if, if, if that is needed. There is a few IP phone infrastructure requirements. Um, some of these are new, so I just kind of want to cover these. Um, LLDP um, is actually supported on the, IFO, uh, on the IP phones. Um, this is mostly used for two purposes. One is VLAN assignment. Um, there's some, you can do quas and that sort of thing with, on the network with VLANing. The primary use generally is to enable uh, the IP phones that get a different class of IP address. Maybe there might be a private IP address space with this certain VLAN that you want to return for these phones. You can also actually use this as part of location discovery for that location service you know, that I discussed earlier. LLDP essentially broadcasts the um, switch and the port number uh, that the phone is connected to, and that can be defined in the list I talked about earlier, so that if you have a location with that you know, switch and port number, you can actually get an accurate you know, like office number if you'd, you'd like. Uh, power over Ethernet is supported. Um, it's not required, but um, talking to our IP phone people, it says that people seem to make a mistake and order these and then forget they don't want to do power over an Ethernet and they forgot to order adapters, so to make a note about that, so I did. There is DNS requirements. Those are roughly the same as, as R2. I don't want to get into that. Um, but they're basically used to discover where the, you know, the SIP server is. There's some new DHCP requirements that were introduced because of common area phones when we actually do this pin off, because we actually don't have any user credentials to do a DNS query. So there are actually a couple of DHCP options. You know, the, the obvious preference is that if you can actually get those set on your existing DHCP servers, that's probably the best way to go. If necessary, you can actually turn on DHCP server on the link servers, you know, not have it rendering out IP addresses, but it could actually return these options if you would or if you would like. Uh, that would actually require, I think you have to, you know, make sure you relay those requests depending upon where the users are and then where the link servers are in your network. You might have to pass those through based those broadcast requests. Analog phones, we also introduce support for. We don't have a direct analog phone. It actually integrates through our partner gateways. Um, and you see from the diagram here, they have ATAs that actually plug into their gateways. So you can separate these from the, the <coughs> pardon, the gateway itself. The interesting point from, from our perspective is, is we wanted to make sure we could actually manage the routing of those and the, and the policy like author, authorization associated with those. So they actually route through, you know, through link server both directions. Not only were we able to you know, control the policies, but we actually then log CDR and stuff to the monitoring server as well. So it's just like another link endpoint from that perspective, though it is connected up through a partner gateway. Um, it also allows you to essentially do that sort of config in a central spot instead of having to go into the gateway and you know, manage a, kind of a like a dial plan for each you know, gateway, which it can be a little bit tedious. 
voice routing. Um, we got a lot of feedback from customers. Uh, prior to this release, we didn't really have the capability to do trunk translations. And by that, I mean like the example here where Alice dials this number. I believe that's a, it's either Germany or UK. I don't remember which one 4.4 four, four is. But what, what happens is, is that <clears throat> after we actually decide we need to route this call to a specific gateway, we can actually look at that gateway and say, oh, there's some rules that this gateway wants numbers to not be in this E.164 format like this. I need to add something in front of it, or I need to strip some digits off. Prior to that, customers had to actually go out to each gateway oftentimes and actually do some of this config on the gateway. They decided they'd rather have that all done in a central place, so we now support that capability. Um, and again, you can do it on you know, the same number. You can actually do different manipulations on based upon you know, who's calling because they can, they can egress to a different trunk. The mediation server co-location, this isn't so much a feature as a, a, an interesting um, byproduct of some, some work we did um, to, you know, that you can capitalize on the TCO and the topology that uh, your mediation servers are deployed. Prior to this release, there was a one-to-one -one relationship between the mediation servers and the gateways. And generally, those mediation servers are also deployed out near where the gateways were. So it actually could be a bit of a hassle, not only, you know, you know, in addition to the capital cost, you actually have to support these initial machines. We now have the capability that a single mediation server can actually talk to many gateways. Um, we changed some of our routing logic around so that that, that actually works properly. Um, but the interesting part of this comes in when you actually combine this with media bypass. And, and I think media bypass is either was discussed or is going to be discussed in Francois' session later today. But we have the capability to not actually send media through the mediation server anywhere. So the signaling path will still go through so we can actually you know, modify the, the SIP information as needed, but the media doesn't necessarily need to go through there. So what this allows, if you have gateways scattered at all branch offices, for instance, all over the US, you can actually consolidate your mediation servers back in the data center and actually can achieve a much better you know, TCO, both from a capital cost as well as an operational thing. So this is a, a very important uh, uh, improvement that we did. Last feature here, I think, on the list, uh, we added specific around uh, link from a voice perspective as malicious call trace. Again, this, this feature has been in, in the PBX world for a number of years. It essentially allows an end user to make sure that the, a certain call they made was flagged as malicious so that an admin can actually go back and later get those call details and try and figure out if there's some sort of corrective action that, that's needed there. This is actually supported in all of our Link, 2000, Link clients, you know, 2010 clients, the uh, Link soft phone, the phone edition, and the attendant council. Um, there is a specific tag on these that get, that get logged into the CDR database. And uh, I did note there's actually uh, just, I think, about a week ago, somebody wrote a blog on, on actually how this process works and how you can actually go and do this report. So I noted where that is. It's a good article. Unified messaging. Um, UM, it's still the only voicemail solution for Link. It's not a new feature. Um, but from a planning perspective, I, I want to talk about a few things that people that haven't deployed this before should be cautious of. And then I'll talk about some new stuff we did with Office 365. So uh, Link supports UM on Exchange versions, Exchange 2007, SP1, and above. So actually, 2007 uh, RTM, uh, we do not support. But if you, you have to at least be on SP1 and above, including uh, 2010 version. Um, some guidance, a couple of people uh, in booth, uh, at the Microsoft booth that asked me about this as well. Hey, where do I put this UM box? Do I put this next to my users or the link servers or keep it with the exchange servers? And the guidance is very clearly to keep it with your exchange servers. That, that, that mappy protocol traffic between the UM server and the backend mailbox is much more sensitive to delays than the VoIP traffic is. So definitely move that there. Um, we do support uh, Link being in one forest and the exchange servers being in another forest. The key requirement there is that there is a user attribute, an exchange dial plan user attribute that's, that's on the user, and that actually has to be copied into the Link forest. So if the UM server is not in the same forest that Link is, you're going to have to use something like ILM 
or another tool to actually make, the, make sure those Active Directory attributes are synced over into the link for us, because that's what link actually uses to route the calls. Um, shifting gears a little bit, we did add support for hosted uh, Exchange UM that's part of Office 365. They just announced the beta, um, I believe, uh, recently. Um, I know there's some customers trying this out, but you can actually integrate um, to both an on-prem exchange you know, deployment and a hosted exchange UM deployment at the same time. The integration is very much different. And I talked a little bit ago about the user attribute being you know, what need to be in the forest and copied over from exchange UM. There's actually a separate user attribute used for this um, that can actually be set as part of the ma move mailbox. You know, so when Exchange moves a mailbox from on-prem to the cloud, they'll actually set this. Um, the link admin can explicitly set it as needed, um, but it, it is definitely different. Um, and you also actually need to do the, some edge server configuration on link because these calls are actually routed through our edge server. And uh, you basically just have to go in and say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm using the same namespace up in the cloud so that it doesn't get confused when it receives a call on where, where to send this thing to. Okay, um, so I, I, I mentioned when I started that in addition to covering some of the um, core link features that we introduced in the Wave 14 release here, I wanted to talk a little bit also about just general routing and the planning around that and some guidance on that. So I wanna shift gears towards that and Hopefully this um, answers some questions to some people. Um, it's certainly not an all authoritative, or authoritative source, but uh, there's a, a lot of questions that come in about, hey, how does this routing work? And I, you know, I, I'd like to walk through that a little bit. So one of the core components of routing is, is dial plans. And anybody that's a PBX person is very familiar with what dial plans are. Um, it's the same thing on link as they are on any other PBX. You, you basically have to you know, list out all of the extensions that people can dial. Um, in our part, what dialing, dial, dial plans are is we have something called a normalization rule. Link requires when it routes numbers, it needs them to be in E.164 format. And for those of you who don't know, know what that is, it's actually a, a standard phone number format. Uh, one way to distinguish that is you can actually see a plus in front of a number. So like a plus one, four, two, five, so on and so forth. Would, if it was you know, fully configured, would be classified as an E164 number. So dial plans have lists of these normalization rules that any user can actually dial. So if they dial five digits, you create a normalization rule that basically turns that into the full 10 digit number. If they can dial seven digit outside, you actually turn that into the full 10 digits. So um, you, need, you need dial plans, you know, basically for wherever um, users are located. So you actually might need them in all the different branch offices because they might have different dialing rules, obviously. So if you have you know, seven digit local dialing in some cities like there is in Seattle, you would need a dial plan specific to that. Um, and just something of note here that normalization rules are actually specified using .NET regular expressions. I don't know if people are actually um, familiar with .NET regular expressions. Um, it would take a little bit of research to actually configure normalization rules, but we actually do kind of shield the user from a lot of this in our control panel admin, so you don't have to be a .NET regular expression expert to configure dial plans. Um, but they are very powerful. Uh, generally though, and I'm not an expert on them, but I think generally if you actually get the first couple of configured, you're probably gonna be using the same patterns over and over again. So even if you didn't use a control panel, it's not something that's, that's super complicated. Um, I titled this planning for dial plans, but it's just some guidance around when you're actually considering to do this, you know, kind of what you actually need to go through. And again, as PBX people, you're kind of used to a lot of this stuff. This one explicitly call out. It's best early on to actually go ahead and I just identify all these areas where you have local dialing requirements because you will need a dial plan for that that's separate and specific to this. Um, as part of that, identifying all the, the valid numbers you know, in that area. This is where the real tedious work is because that can change. And chances are if it's a large company with a lot of branches, there's not one single person that actually has all of that information. You might have to collect it from the branch or whoever's maintaining the PBX at the certain branch. Um, it's really a, a, an opportunity to probably standardize on this. If you are planning on doing a, a major link rollout, um, maybe re-examine what your dialing is. People do click the call generally. I very rarely actually enter a phone number in my link client anymore. I type somebody's name in and I click call so and so. 
So the, the idea you may not actually even need internal extensions. That may be a bit of a stretch for some people in their minds right now, but I actually can't remember the last time I dialed one at work. Um, there's something called a dial plant scope. I'm going to get into that in a little bit, but it's something you actually need to figure out, how these dial plans are actually assigned to the users. I'll get into the details. Um, just uh, kind of a you know, informational thing. Dial plans are, 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 are retrieved by our link clients through in-band provisioning. So um, it's just something generally the client will actually normalize this number before it ever gets to the link server. Just a bit of information. Um, it's kind of relevant to the IP phones in particular because we actually use this interdigit timeout and it uses these dial plans to figure out, oh, hey, I matched something up you know, I've got something here, I want to send the call out, or I need to wait around for, if, I, if I don't have a match for it. I talked about dial plan scope. This is, <coughs> pardon, this is actually an important um, um, design consideration because it can actually be used to make your life really easily. If your corporation fits into this, you don't necessarily need to assign a user policy. Um, Generally, though, I think most larger companies would actually need something like a specific user policy. But a, a dial plan scope is, is basically you, any given user has to be assigned a dial plan. And the option are to be explicitly assigned one or to pick one up automatically. So if there's a need to explicitly sign one, I'll talk about that next, then you actually need to assign that to a user. Otherwise, you can actually ex ex build a dial plan for different scopes. You can build pool dial plans. Like the list here shows there's uh, two pools in Chicago. For some reason, there might be an, a need to actually um, have a certain group of people on a dedicated pool of link servers. Those people, actually, you could say, you know what, I'm going to build a, a pool dial plan. And they would just, and everybody on that pool would inherit the same dial plan. You knew they were all in the same spot. It's probably not going to be an issue. Um, conversely, you could define one at the site, which is maybe the Uber of Chicago, where all the the, the, like the link, I don't know if you've taken any of the link planning stuff, but there's a concept called a link site, which is where our essentially front end pools are. You could have a, you know, a massive dial plan that everybody, and they might only have to support E164 dialing, but uh, it's possible that in some companies such a scope might exist. And then global is kind of the last resort. You know, all across Contoso, you could actually set up some global dial plan if you would. But, Generally what happens is these are, these are scoped from bottom to top. If you're assigned a user dial plan, there's no question that's what you have. That's always what you have, um, no matter what. Um, and if you're not, um, then you actually go up, and if you have a pool one defined, for instance, you would, you, know, you would inherit the dial plan for your pool. If not, you'd inherit the dial plan for your site. This kind of relates to all policies within Link, so this is not a new concept with Link in general. Um, there's a couple of kind of best practices here. Um, most companies that I've talked to have done user-based policies, and even those ones that are at you know, branch offices. So the reason this gets a little interesting is because in theory, a branch office, a survival branch office appliance is actually considered a site, or I'm sorry, it's considered a pool within Link. And you'd say, gosh, this is an easy way. The people that are at these branch offices would actually just pick up these policies automatically, and you don't have to do any user management. The problem with that is, is that people at, you know, particularly with Link, people tend to get up from branch offices and travel around and still have Link and call, and they expect their calling to be the same. And instead, what could happen is they could then transfer to another site and pick up a different dial plan automatically. So generally, the way you get around that is actually just assign a user level dial plan. Um, just um, an additional bit of information, this pool scope is also used for gateways so that when, when an incoming call comes into link, we actually, uh, uh, <coughs> the, the mediation server in front of link actually recognizes what this gateway, it has a specific dial plan associated with it. So it can prepend digits and things like that as well. So it helps with digit manipulation before it ever gets into link for a route, routing decision. Voice policies. Uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, OCS, um, we did not provide a lot of voice policy control for features. I think the only one we provided was probably turning off call forwarding, I think. We actually added capability and link to actually turn off 
all of these different features within a given voice policy. Again, voice policies are assigned to users just like dial plans are. There's a scope, I'll show the scoping, it's slightly different. But you can go in, you're, this is a screenshot of the link control panel, and you can actually go in and set these specific voice policies up, as, you know, customize them and actually assign them to users in, in such a fashion. Um, one thing besides features, and, and this is old news for people that have deployed this, but this is also actually where we actually assign routing privileges. We have this concept called a PSTN usage. PSTN usages are what allow routes to be made on a specific user by user basis. And they generally are something like you would get PSTN usages that said I'm able to do internal calls, I'm able to do local calls, I'm able to do long distance calls, but maybe I can't do international calls or something like that. And I'll talk about that in a sec, because it's kind of a, usages are probably the most, um, a little bit more complicated aspect of routing. Voice policy scope, excuse me. It's very similar to the dial plan scope that I talked about a little bit before. The difference is, is that we don't have pool policy for this. Um, again, the best practices are you should probably just assign a voice policy directly to a user to, to prevent people from picking up different policies should they roam around. If you can actually, you're a, a fairly, I, I want to call it a fairly simple topology, you actually may be able to actually define some sort of site level or global vo voice, voice policy. It's great if you can. Um, in larger companies where people move around, they have different groups of people with different you know, requirements and restrictions, like oftentimes temp workers and stuff, you don't want to grant them all these full privileges. So you then have to start getting down and actually probably assigning user policies for that. Um, it's kind of a funny title, Planning for PSTN Usages. Um, I, I talked about them again. This is a, a, a little bit of, uh, people have a lot of questions in this area. and. I, I want to just walk through this a little bit. It's a refresher course, a little bit of best practice stuff in here, but PSTN usages, I've talked to them before in, in, in two spots. When we talked about a dial plan on a user, I, I, I'd mentioned that you also assign uh, PSTN usages. Uh, that was, sorry, I'm, it, was, it wasn't the dial plan, it was the voice policy. You assigned a PSTN usage. Um, we're gonna talk about routes in a bit. You actually also assign PSTN usages in routes. So what really PSTN usages are, they're like descriptive tags that uh, these voice policies and routes are used to kind of reference each other. And I have a diagram that hopefully will make that make a little more sense in a bit. But they're nothing, they're, they're nothing but labels. But what they are is labels that you should actually, um, I, I'd say, contextually define. So something like you would, like in Atlanta, you'd want to create a PSTN usage for the Atlanta office, all the Atlanta local, if you would, or something like US long distance, you know, and, and a user would get assigned both of these PSTN usages, but you'd actually want to have these, you know, easy to understand, but that's really what they do, is they're basically for permission, if you would. Um, the result is, is that, you know, a user gets a list of these, you might have one, you might have 10, you know, when, when a user makes a call, it actually, our routing logic grabs the first usage and actually says, oh, are you able to make this call? And if, if you are, so on, you know, it'll process that. And if you're not, then it'll actually, or it doesn't match, it goes down to the next one, and then it keeps iterating through that. So um, you can actually establish priority of routes, so it's kind of useful for least cost routing, um, meaning you could, you could do something like, um, grant somebody a local dialing privileges for this office and then create another one for long distance. And you know, for some reason, um, you weren't actually able to go out this local, the PRI was down or something, you can actually you know, have it fall back and it would, you can dial out a different gateway if you would and re still reach the same local number, so. Planning voice routes, this is the last piece of it. So there was voice policies, there's PSTN usages, and then there's voice routes. Routes are actually what, what um, are, are defined to actually take dial strings, numbers that users dial, they're, you know, that actually need to be routed somewhere. So we convert them into E164 format, but we actually need to then say, you know, this doesn't match a user, this doesn't match some, you know, orbit range, it's not a part of a unassigned number, it's a call that actually needs to go out to the PSTN or to a PBX or something outside of the link environment. So you actually you create, you know, routes that specify, you know, dial strings. Again, we use regex to do this, but you actually point to a gateway. So you have to have at least one gateway when, when you create a route. 
an interesting way to do resiliency. So MSIT, for instance, at their branch offices, when they, they were early adopters of this, obviously. And um, one of their issues was, you know, hey, how do we really handle support for these gateways? Do we actually get a contract with somebody that has spares in case a gateway goes down and all that stuff? And what they decided to do is actually said, you know what, let's just put in two gateways. They're reasonably affordable. We'll put them in both spots. If one goes down, then we've got a fair amount of time to actually get a new one out there and just plug it in. So it provided gateway resiliency. So you go into a route, and then they just put in two gateways at, at identical. So our routing logic, there's two gateways in a, in a route would actually essentially balance the calls between the two of them. Um, again, routes get assigned PSTN usages. So just like the voice policy, this user got assigned, you know, something that said like local calls, you know, long distance international calls, you assign a PSTN usage to a route as well. And that's what does the match. So when Roy makes a call, our routing logic looks at this and said, Roy has these three usages, you know, let me now look at the routes starting from the first one that's defined, you know, and say, oh, it's got this usage, you know, does this match? Let me make this call and it'll kind of iterate through any combination of usage and routes and hopefully my call will be made. I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, you can also use least cost routing to do this. You know, this is how you would use least cost routing. You would create a route specifically for a, maybe you're a, a, a United States company and you actually want to have, uh, you know, your European calls actually you know, route across your own network to Europe and then actually be handed off onto the PSDN network. You can do this very easily from, from this approach. So here's a visual of how call authorization and routing. Again, the PSDN usage stuff is in the middle. I talked before about it was kind of a link between, between uh, the routes and voice policies. Briefly, again, voice policies are, are um, they do call authorization. Um, basically, it's, you know, can Roy make this call? Can Roy make a long distance call? Can Roy make an international call? They also dictate feature set. Uh, PSDN usage, again, they're just purposes. You know, you define a, a tag that says something like, you know, long distance, Atlanta local, you know, that sort of thing. And you can actually order them so you can create priorities. So you actually can try the Atlanta local before the, the, the long distance. Um, and routes, again, they're mostly around the, you know, the number that it's called, any sort of cost associated with that. So you can define, you know, this number string, I'm gonna send it to this gateway, or I'm gonna send it here. So you can use your own network uh, just to save some money. The interesting thing about this is if you actually look at this, it can actually also decouple the work string a little bit, meaning somebody can actually be very good at creating routes, maintaining dial patterns, all of that sort of thing. And they basically don't necessarily have to have any you know, interaction with the people that are main, you know, assigning voice policies to users or actually creating voice policies. That interaction all happens on the PSTN usage basis. So it also makes it very easy to create a new route. So for instance, I've decided I needed a new route for some reason. I actually can go in and ass assign this to these PSTN usages. And I actually didn't necessarily have to create a new voice policy to do that. I've just inherited because I already had those defined. If I need to create a new voice policy, the same concept. For some reason, the clicker is not very functional. Same concept, you can create a new voice policy and, and assign it to the PSTN usages. Again, you don't have to go and change any routes to do that. So it actually can really help your, your admin work stream. So, um, Kind of in conclusion, I want to just walk through our routing logic a little bit. Um, it, it, it ties a lot of these constructs together. So there's a few things that happen. Uh, this is a very simplified version. It's a little more complicated than this. But from a high level, what happens in somebody dials a number and link, first thing we do is we normalize that thing. So if that number is, nor you know, we, we normalize it, get an E164 format. We then actually do what we call a reverse number lookup. We have this logic that basically says, you know, Roy has this SIP URI and Roy has this phone number. So we basically look at this phone number because we've normalized it into this full phone number. And if that's correlated to me as a user, we'll actually just say, oh, that's, that's this internal user. I'm gonna route this to an internal user. So in this case, that would never ever get any outside the network. If that failed, 
meaning somebody dialed a number, wasn't somebody internal, the next thing we actually do is make sure it's not part, part of those call park orbits that I talked about a little while ago, and to make sure that it's not part of the unassigned numbers. If it is, we match that up and then route the call according to the way that's defined. You know, if it's not, that's when our outbound routing logic fully kicks in. What happens there is we actually then you know, say, okay, Roy made this call. Roy had these three usages. The first one might have been you know, local calls. So it actually goes and checks each route you know, that contains this usage and then basically looks for a destination number that matches the, 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 the dial string that I dialed. If that matches, it says, okay, here's the gateway that's defined for this route. If it doesn't match, it goes on to the next usage in the list and repeats that process over again. So that's basically what w the way routing works in a very simplified manner. So some people find this extremely confusing. I, that's why I spent some time on this. I, 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 I doubt somebody could learn this full topic just from reading this, but it's defined pretty well in our planning guide and stuff. So uh, I, I, I do recognize that people actually you know, have to you know, plan their routing with, with, with any sort of link voice deployment, so I wanted to talk about it. Um, here's a graphical version of the same thing. I actually have about 20 different slides of all different kinds of calls that I, you know, created for this presentation, but uh, you would probably definitely fall asleep completely if I went through all of those. So that same example I just gave, graphically, there's a link user, a UC endpoint on top, dial the call, in this case, uh, 206 555 um, We have this translation app. Um, it's <coughs> I'm sorry, it's already actually in full dot E164 number format. The translation could actually change that, you know, you know, add, you know, or normalize this if for some reason it wasn't already normalized. Um, it is possible to get calls into link that aren't normalized by the clients, like some from Exchange UM, for instance. Um, what happens then, we do this reverse number lookup, what I talked about before. Um, we can look at this and say, if it's successful, you know, Bob in this case is the user, it would actually pass this down to inbound routing. Bob would receive the call. It's in, you know, if he wasn't there, it would go to voicemail sort of thing. If Bob, if this actually didn't match, meaning this was not Bob's user, this reverse number lookup would fail and we'd pass this E164 address over to this outbound routing component. And actually there is when you'd look and, and, and outbound routing would go through these PSTN usages that I talked about. If it found a match, it would look at that gateway and say, okay, here's the gateway. Um, now I need to know, is there any trunk translation rules on that? Meaning, do I need to strip some digits? Do I need to add some digits? That sort of thing. And it will actually you know, do that, pass the thing to the appropriate mediation server, which then routes it to the correct gateway. So, so that was the last slide. I do actually have a couple of slides on E911. If people actually want to go through that, there's. Um, there's a, about, uh, I think, like seven, eight minutes before we're supposed to do Q&A, so um, if, I'll just walk through that and then we can take some questions. So, so I talked about Enhanced 911 a little bit. Um, if, uh, um, I didn't get into details. Like I said, you could do, I've done deep dives on this with both customers and presentations and it can easily take an hour. But I wanted to just walk people through how this works end to end. Um, what happens is there is a list here um, and it's part of the, the, the front end server. Um, it's nothing more than, you know, there's, there's, there is a database that's stored in the back end, but the list is actually a web service that contains all of these potential locations. Um, the, there is another component. Uh, I'm missing a piece on my deck here. I need to walk, there we go, oops. Um, so the first step is the, the admin actually needs to create these network elements that I talked about with locations and stuff and actually define these in the list. I also talked about that there is actually a, a need for a 911 service provider. There's this process called address validation that you need to do to make sure addresses are in the correct format and all of that. There's a whole litany of fields and, and, and different return codes that actually could come back. But it, you know, it is necessary to really validate these addresses so these calls can be routed properly. Um, what happens after that you know, is the client process. So the client itself, um, how this works, and I just showed this um, you know, phone number in Redmond with a MAC address and a subnet just, to, you know, just for reference. And uh, this is the actual port that this person's assigned on, uh, switch ID in case they did LLDP med. But when the client registers, it essentially takes everything it knows about itself from a, 
a network connectivity perspective. It says, here's my subnet, if I got some LLDP information, here, if I'm connected wireless, here's the BSS ID. And it actually passes this on, and it's called a location request, to the list. The list has these network elements defined. It starts with wireless and works its way down. If it actually finds a match, it then just simply returns this location back. So at this point, this is what happens by default. You know, you don't have to enable clients to do this. You know, if you don't populate lists, the client just asks for a location and it doesn't return one. So nothing to do with 911 to this point, really. So, but this is how you can actually light up location. The next part of this is really how routing, routing fully works. So um, <clears throat> if a user is enabled for 911, they get a dial string, you know, as part of a policy that says 911 is your dial string, you're enabled for this, you go acquire a location, you know, there's some backups, and you know, we allow users in our location if one's not found and, and various things. What happens, the server actually recognizes that. We have a special routing mechanism for emergency calls, and we'll pass that along. So the client actually takes the location it got, in the SIP invite that's sent, it actually includes all of that information into the, into the body of the SIP invite it actually is sent along. It's sent to one of these emergency service providers. We're using a couple in the US, um, uh, Connexon or 911 Enable, and then uh, Intrado, I think, has been announced as well. Um, they have a special application in their network that actually parses these. They'll look at this location. Once they do that, they can figure out, OK, this actually needs to be connected to Chicago. They have a network to all the Chicago or all the PSAPs, you know, most, the majority of them in the US, and they will actually do that routing. They will actually also do the conferencing. That's how the security desk would actually get conferenced in. So anyway, that's the kind of high level uh, call flow for E911, the end of the presentation. There is a bunch of additional appendix slides. If you do want to download this and want to see how different calls are actually routed through link, I included those. So. If anybody has any questions, please uh, stop up to the microphone. Um, and uh, make sure you fill out your evals as well. And uh, one other quick note, there is another session on interop this afternoon. I think it's at 4.30. So if you want to figure out an interop with different PBXs and stuff, I would recommend going to that. <laughs>